recording again. All right, morning, everybody. We're starting a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm glad you're all here. This is our first webinar. I don't know if the difference between a webinar and a, a meeting with a lot of people and a presenter, but uh, we'll figure it out. i have giving you an update on EAB, what's the latest and greatest, and given our size of our small crowd today, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask during the program. And we can always, I'll post the recording of this on YouTube, but I can also send a copy or post a copy, rather, of the original PowerPoint uh, if you want. I can put that anywhere. So um, very briefly, I will give a background and introduction. I think most of us know uh, about EAB are familiar with it. It's emerald ash borer. It uh, is the insect. It's an Asian species of buprested. Buprested, uh, especially the agrilus, are metallic um, wood boring beetles. And it came to the U.S. in the mid-1990s in the Detroit, Michigan area. Uh, it came in the 1990s, but nobody figured out what it was until about 2002. And uh, they knew right away at that point that uh, it was going to be a big problem. And it kills all ash trees. That is ash in the genus Fraxinus. Uh, it does have preferences. It loves our green ash and our black ash. So uh, that's going to be causing some problems for us. There's a species called blue ash that it doesn't do well on, uh, but it can attack. Uh, but we don't have blue ash in North Dakota. Unless you ask Todd West, there's a super secret one that he knows about somewhere. Uh, the Manchurian ash that we sometimes plant in, in boulevards and sometimes does well, sometimes not. Um, that is also attacked here, but uh, being that it's an Asian species of ash, uh, it has a little bit of resistance to EAP. And there's our lovely green ash that we see all over the place, the most common tree in North Dakota. Uh, in boulevards, in shelter belts, uh, I'd say our native forests, it's very common. I don't know if it's the most common, but it's, it's close. And if you're looking for a uh, publication, how to identify ash trees, there you go. Uh, this is an NDSU extension publication, F1633. So there's the URL. Want me to, Todd's writing it down, so want me to wait for you, Todd? No. Nope. Okay, we'll go on then. Okay, it's, this does not kill mountain ash trees. Mountain ash trees are in the genus Sorbus, and uh, that is in the rose family. So the European mountain ash, showy mountain ash, uh, oak leaf mountain ash, all the mountain ashes, they are not attacked by EAB, and they will be fine. So... That is it in terms of introduction and background. Uh, you're up to speed. Okay. Uh, the question, one of the questions I often get is, where is EAB? You know, how far is it expanded? And uh, you know, I, I kind of got this image of, you know, where's EAB? Where's Waldo? And well, because sometimes looking for EAB and trying to find it is really hard to do. So that being said. Uh, here is the latest and greatest uh, EAB information. Uh, the yellow are the counties where it has been found in, pre in previous years, and the red is uh, the counties where it has been found this year, new county detections. And uh, it's spreading out. That original, original find back in 2002 was in the Detroit, Michigan area, southeast Michigan. New finds this year include Superior, Wisconsin, which is right across the river from Duluth, and in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, these things have us a little worried. Uh, you know, Superior is as far north as Fargo, anyway. Um, I don't think it's any closer than Minneapolis is, uh, but it's still as far north, and it has some concerns. And then it uh, then it skipped completely over most of the Great Plains and then and ended up in Boulder, Colorado. So where are we going to find it next? I, I don't know. Uh, if you're looking for where EAB is, this is the uh, this is the map that is constantly updated 
you know, monthly, maybe every other month uh, throughout the growing season. But that is the latest and greatest. If you want to find the spread of emerald ash borer, uh, go to that website. Is EAB in North Dakota? And I give this uh, caveat. I say not yet. Uh, <laughs> not yet as far as we know. Uh, this, you know, we it could be here and we don't know it. Um, most of the finds, uh, EAB has been in a location for three to five years before it has been found. So it could be here, but right now we're saying it's not because we haven't found it. Uh, how do we know that? Well, besides all the eyeballs out there looking for it, uh, there's a trapping program. There's a federal, federally funded trapping program by USDA APHIS, uh, nearly 500 traps throughout the state. And here's the map of the trap locations in 2012. Uh, 2013 was similar in terms of trap locations throughout the state. Uh, this is the purple sticky traps. Um, these are, these do okay. They've uh, been improved over the years. The lure has been improved. Uh, the color was tested, green versus purple, kind of a lime green actually. Uh, and this is what uh, they came up with, and it works pretty well. Uh, I do want to say 2013 was similar in terms of locations, and we tried something a little different this year. And I say we because I'm the one who kind of nudged uh, my colleagues to do it. There's a pheromone that's been discovered and developed uh, for EAB, finally. And they're using it in Canada. And we decided to get some. I had a little bit of extra funding. Uh, Aaron Bergdahl from the North Dakota Forest Service had a little bit of extra funding. And we bought a couple dozen, three dozen lures uh, that we put into these traps, the pheromone lures. And the long and the short of it is no EAB was found uh, throughout the state, even with those pheromone lures. So, you know, so far so good. We're pretty pleased about that. And uh, hopefully we'll continue to not find EAB. Yeah, we're actually excited about being not successful. Okay, so besides the trapping program, uh, we have been running this first detector program for the last three years, four years, really. Uh, it's a cooperative effort among NDSU Extension, ND, ND Forest Service, and ND Department of Agriculture. And we've trained over 240 people since 2010, and basically these are extra eyes in the field. Um, and it's part of that is, you know, we, we do with the PowerPoints, we show pictures, uh, show slides, and that's great, and that, hel that helps. But part of it is we actually peel logs, and we look for EAB, and we show people where to find EAB, how to look for EAB. And we found some really neat insects in these logs under the bark, but we haven't actually found EAB, thank goodness. Um, you know, that's one of my fears is that we'll be doing one of these training sessions and that's where we actually find EAB. And uh, maybe at the end of this, I'll ask Steve and Todd, who I know have done some log peeling, uh, what your opinion about this is, what your experiences are. And we'll continue this though. Whoops. I Hit the wrong button. Okay, uh, hold on a sec. Let me make sure I'm still recording here. Okay, I am still recording. I hit the wrong button. Sorry. Okay, uh, 2014, we we're planning to work with Master Gardeners in the first first detector program, and uh, Todd and Esther uh, be meeting with you uh, to discuss this. We're going to hopefully start in Fargo. Uh, not sure exactly when. Sometime over the winter and uh, might do this as an advanced master gardener training or uh, I'm not sure how this is going to work with the master gardener group, but uh, we'll talk and figure it out. Okay, so beyond the first detector program, uh, there are several other methods that are being used in, in other places around the country that we're not using. There's a branch sampling technique that uh, works pretty good. Uh, statistically, you've got a certain chance of finding EAB if it's there. There's the stuck program, which is which cracks me up. Sticky traps using cadavers. They yeah. actually have dead EABs uh, attached to sticky traps. Uh, 
Um, it's pretty funny. Uh, dogs have been trained to sniff out, maybe not EAB yet, but they can sniff out ash, ash logs, ash firewood, and they're still working on that in terms of uh, actually finding the insect. There's a predatory wasp that people monitor sometimes to see uh, what it's bringing back and if it's bringing back EAB. Uh, and also people have used girdled trap trees to bring in ash, uh, to bring in EAB. And we're not using that here. It's very time consuming, pretty effective, but very time consuming. Another common question. Is North Dakota too cold for EAB? And I, I've often said no, but now I'm saying probably no, probably not. Um, here's the native range of EAB, and I do want to point out EAB does not stop at the border of China and Mongolia or China and Russia. EAB certainly ranges further north, uh, but that's that's the, the map we have. Um, and if you look at the uh, latitude of Fargo, the latitude of Botno, compared to this, yeah, we're we're plenty far north. Um, yeah, sorry, the native range of of EAB is plenty far north, um, such that you know it should be able to survive here. And okay, oh darn, that didn't come through. Uh, that high point in China is at 53 degrees north. And then uh, Moscow, Russia is at 55 degrees north. And Moscow plants has planted uh, a lot of our green ash over there. That's a great street tree. And what they have found is they found EAB at 55 degrees north latitude. So that's uh, – it doesn't provide me with a whole lot of hope about EAB uh, not surviving winters here. Joe? So can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Uh, uh, what, if you're just going by pure latitude, do you think that's as accurate a descriptor as as uh, other weather conditions? I mean, I, I know that they may be further north than us, but do they have the same weather conditions that we have, uh, cold temperature and that type of stuff? Steve, that's a, a great question, and it's a fair question. Uh, I don't know. I can only assume it's a continental climate. Um, I'm really not familiar with that part of the world, though. And uh, that's a good question. Um, Esther, you had something too? Well, Steve, I had something similar too. So they found um, uh, they found that infestation in Superior, Wisconsin, but I believe that Superior, Wisconsin has that lake effect um, around it, and as such as like zone five as opposed to zone three and four like we are. So, so it's hard for us to, to extrapolate, okay, if Superior Wisconsin has it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we would get it either. And that's correct. Uh, Superior is actually, uh, there, there's a little bit of the, the lake effect there such that if you look at the, the zone maps, um, Superior does get, I think it's zone 5, like you said. Um, it is a little bit warmer. Now, that being said, oops, dang, I hit the wrong button again. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, but now we're starting to wonder if maybe parts of the state might be uh, okay. And this is based on a very new article. Uh, this was published last summer, uh, DeSantis et al. Uh, in Agricultural and Forest Meteorology. And uh, basically they did a lot of temperature modeling. It's, it's a lot of math, a lot of statistics, uh, stuff that's way over my head. Uh, but they modeled the temperature, but they also modeled EAB uh, populations and ash populations and uh, what EAB can take, how cold it can get uh, based on laboratory studies. And the long and the short of it is what it turned out is they, they produced this nice map. And in the green, yeah, in the green areas, theoretically, winter temperatures are supposed to get cold enough to kill EAB. Now, that's in theory, and I'm not sure how often that's supposed to be. Um, I, that's one thing I really was confused about in that paper. Uh, they said some place in that zone will get cold enough every four years. Okay, well, maybe it gets cold enough in Botno 
one year and then uh, Duluth in, you know, another year, and it doesn't get cold enough in Botno for another 10, 15 years, so populations can build up again. Um, nevertheless, uh, I'm not... I'm not preaching this as gospel truth, that it's too cold here. It might be. Uh, this is actually a little bit of hope, um, but let's be cautious about that. So, whoops. So, Joe? Yes. Sorry, one more interruption. How far has uh, EAB been detected into Canada? Uh, it's about the same. It's only in two provinces, uh, Ontario and Quebec. Uh, but it's about the same latitude as the UP, the Upper Peninsula okay. of Michigan. Okay. So about as far north as it's been found in the U.S. Okay, and there's Superior, Wisconsin, which is in their green zone, uh, which is very interesting because, like you pointed out, Esther, yeah, Superior does get that lake effect, and it is actually in a different hardiness zone. Okay, once the AB gets here, how do we control it? Well, there's, we have a publication on that. Uh, Jan Knodel led this one. So, uh, publication E1634, Biology and Integrated Pest Management of the Emerald Ash Borer in North Dakota. Wait till Todd's done writing it down. This is just like, like, so I'm just drying the insect. Oh, sure, okay. It's just like in front of a class when I teach. Okay. Uh, when we think of integrated pest management, of course, we think of uh, cultural control, biological control, and chemical, some combination. So, you know, cultural control. Let's cut down all infested ash trees plus a half a mile around them to get ahead of the infestation. And that's what they tried early on in Michigan, and it didn't work. Uh, we could cut down as many ash trees as we can find, and we're still not going to find them all. Uh, and additionally, Finding the insect at low population densities is really hard. So um, this doesn't work. So basically what I'm recommending now is I'm, I'd like people to try to pre-mitigate, in terms of a cultural practice anyway. Pre-mitigate is what I'm calling it. I don't know if that's the right word. But basically cut down some ash now and plant with other species. And the example I give are, are trees like this, trees that are growing under a power line uh, that are causing problems, cut them down and plant some crab apples under the power line. Get a new canopy started now so that, that by the time EAB gets here, we've got a new canopy growing and well established. Maybe Obviously, we're not going to get uh, the benefits from a smaller tree or a younger tree that we do from a mature tree. Uh, but we can at least get that change started. I'm not recommending removing trees that are in good shape. Trees that are in great shape, leave them. Leave them for now if you want. Uh, trees that don't have any problems. Trees that are providing a lot of benefits. You know, uh, maybe that cold temperature issue uh, combined with some other factors will begin to control the insect. Um, I don't recommend that we just put all our eggs in one basket and get rid of every ash tree right now. But, you know, the flip side is I don't want to do nothing either. So uh, it's hard to see. You can't really see on this picture, but those trees do actually have the orange mark of death, and uh, they were going to be taken out and replaced. The other cultural technique is pretty much uh, public outreach in terms of people not moving firewood. Don't move firewood and burn it where you buy it. Uh, those are the, the consistent messages that are trying that we're trying to uh, pass around, pass along uh, throughout the state as well as throughout the country. And I think it's working okay usually. Uh, we do have an EAB video, and there's the URL for that. And it's about a five-and-a-half-minute video. It's fairly short, but it talks about EAB, where it's found, and what we can do uh, to prevent its introduction into North Dakota. Yeah, don't bring firewood. 
in terms of biological control, uh, there's a couple of different things going on here. And for native pests, native predators, native parasites of EAB, really it turns out to be too little too late. I know some people get excited about this and, oh, there's opportunities, but so far, really, uh, it's been too little too late. I think it, the, the percentage control is like 1% of EAB populations, whether that's uh, some type of woodpecker or this Atanacolis uh, wasp, predatory wasp. Uh, really, they're, they're not doing a whole lot unless EAB is already at a, a high uh, at a high uh, population. <laughs> there's <laughs> there's uh, a study that came out this year that was talking about the uh, woodpeckers and how their populations have increased. And it was woodpeckers and nuthatches, I think. And, uh, yeah, I'm not surprised. But it always happens after EAB has already reached its peak. So... Uh, not enough to, to keep EAB under control. Now, that being said, uh, then the, there's been this uh, a big, big effort by the federal government to bring in parasites from China, uh, parasit parasitic wasps. And three that have been really promising are this Oobius, Spathius, and Tetrasticus. Uh, Oobius hits the eggs, tiny little things, um, I think Spathius and Tetrasticus both hit the larvae of EAB. And this is where they've been released, all those green areas, all those green dots. Uh, although this, uh, this map is a little bit older, from March of this year, you can see it's, they, there have been releases in a lot of states throughout the country. Uh, and we've, I've begun discussions with, again, Department of Ag, North Dakota Department of Ag, North Dakota Forest Service, to see if we can get some permits in place uh, before we find EAB here to make sure we can do these releases as well. And uh, what they've been finding is this. Uh, first of all, uh, Oobius and Tetrasticus are doing really well. Um, oh, darn it. Sorry. Keep hitting that wrong button. Maybe I'll teach myself. Okay. The Spathius... Uh, has not been doing so good uh, simply because it, it's a little bit colder further north. They might uh, try using it further south, and they're hoping they can that'll work. So with those two, at least the Oobius and the Tetrasticus, uh, they're showing promise. The populations of these insects are growing. These parasitoid, parasitoid insects are growing, and they're spreading. Uh, they've, they've put these releases out there. And they're recovering these insects uh, year after year, further and further away from the release sites. And the number or percentage of EAB uh, that are parasitized is also growing. Uh, after four years, they were getting like 20% uh, paras parasitization. And, uh, and it seems to be working. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, in the long run, could that be part of a control measure? Yeah, we're hoping. Uh, going back to that Spathius, I do want to point out uh, there's a different Spathius that they're going to try. Uh, I don't remember the, the species name, but it's uh, from further north in China, and they're hoping that will take care of. Uh, that would be just another insect that will be available uh, to control EAB. So that's uh, it for biological control. Chemical control. Everybody wants to know, what can I spray on my tree? I'll tell hey, you Joe, right before now. You go, oh. Joe, this, yes. before you go on into uh, chemical control, uh, getting back to biological control, what sort of tests are done with uh, be, prior to releasing these, uh, these parasites uh, with our native insects? Uh, is there any concern about what impact they may have on uh, insects uh, or parasitizing uh, beneficial insects here? Uh, yes, Steve, that's a great question, and uh, yes, there is concern, and there's uh, a big, long protocol that the people who want to do these releases have to go through first, a uh, testing protocol to see if the, the parasites will switch and start attacking native insects, and 
I, I'd have to recommend, without getting into it too much, <clears throat> I would really like to recommend uh, if you go to EAB University, and that's uh, from the main EAB, emerald-borer.info page. If you go to EAB University, uh, there's a series of archived webinars there. And there was a webinar about two months ago on this very issue that goes into much greater detail about the process. And uh, it's about 50 minutes, a little under an hour. I watched it uh, the other day during lunch, and uh, it really describes it well and the process they've had to go through to ensure that it's, I'm sorry, not to ensure, but to determine the, the risks, the risks and potential rewards. And for the most part, the risks are minimal. Uh, they believe. That is, a lot of the testing showed these parasites did not attack our native species. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Sorry, I, I uh, kind of rambled there a little bit. But, yeah, long and the short of it, EAB University, watch the webinar on biological control. Okay. Chemical control. Uh, oh. I put it in here. Okay. Chemical control. Uh, I first want to point out that any chemical control is only get, only has a chance to work if the tree is not too far gone. These two trees here, there's way too much dieback. Uh, yeah, the tree on the left is what? 90%. Tree on the right, uh, maybe 40 or 50% dieback. Yeah, they, those trees are too far gone. They don't even stand a chance. Uh, these two trees here, the one on the left is, yeah, 90% gone. The one on the right might have a chance. Uh, the current recommendations are that if a tree has less than about 25% dieback, it has a chance. Uh, but beyond that, yeah, don't waste your time and money. So that being said, the, the big three are still uh, imidacloprid, dinotefuran, and emamectin benzoate. We'll talk about these uh, briefly. And imidacloprid is the most common. Uh, imidacloprid is uh, very commonly used. It's uh, the active ingredient in the Bayer Advanced tree and shrub insect control. And there's a whole variety of products out there. Bayer had the... Uh, the patent on this until about oh six or seven years ago. So since that time, uh, a whole bunch of generics have been coming in, um, and they're they're all the same. It's 1.47 percent imidacloprid, but this is the one that homeowners can use. Uh, it can be applied as a soil drench by homeowners. Uh, professionally, it can be applied as a soil injection or stem injection, and you know, nobody's really doing a lot of research on this aspect anymore. Uh, they did it several years ago right away, and they found it was like 70 to 80% effective, uh, which is good. I don't know if that's good enough, though, but very commonly used. And apply it in the spring uh, just as the leaves are starting to unfurl. Okay. Uh, there's another one called dinotefuran. Now, dinotefuran is the same family of chemical as, uh, as imidacloprid. It's in the neonicotinoid uh, group. And dinotefuran uh, is, really, is a little bit different. Uh, for one thing, I want to point out, this can be used as a bark spray. Yeah, it can be used as a soil drench, just like imidacloprid. But... There's another way it can be used, and that's spraying it on the bark and letting it absorb through the bark. It'll go into the xylem and be taken up to the top of the tree. And, uh, you know, okay, so what can I spray on my tree? There you go. Um, there is a homeowner, uh, a homeowner formulation called Xylam, and there's the one, of course, Safari is a professional use. And in terms of results, it's about the same effectiveness as a metacloprid. Then the big gun is emamectin benzoate, and that's sold under the trade name 
triage with a little umlaut, the two dots over the A. I love that name. Um, this is professional use only, and it's, it's with a stem injection, and this is 99 plus percent effective. Uh, this is great stuff. It really gets EAB. Uh, it is effective for two years uh, for sure, and some, t some of the tests have even showed up to three years. Uh, in terms of cost, this is the latest I have heard uh, in terms of cost. Depends on the company, of course. Uh, they're charging anywhere from $8 to $16 per inch of DBH. And so for a 10-inch tree, that would cost anywhere from $80 to $160 for the injection. Now, again, that injection uh, will last for two years. There's enough residual in the canopy of the tree that it'll uh, keep EAB in control, under control for two years. Uh, what kind of questions do you all have about chemical control before we move on? I'm going through a lot of material really fast. What about acephate? Acephate, acephate um, is, uh, acephate I believe does have a little bit of systemic activity, um, but in terms of effectiveness in the, in the tests, very little effectiveness. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm talking about the implant cartridge that they've been advertising. Okay. Like ACE cap? Right, ACE caps. Um, yeah, it, it will help to control EAB, but it certainly doesn't uh, doesn't do as well as these others. Uh, the the I, I can't give you numbers uh, on the the research results, but uh, but I can tell you that I do know they're not close, especially to triage. Nothing's close to triage, but I think it's even lower than that seventy to eighty percent found with the um, imidacloprid. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Spraying the leaves doesn't work. Uh -huh. So spraying with a with seven, spraying with the, whatever chemical uh, insecticide is out there, it just doesn't work to control the insect because the ins the the life stage that does the damage is the larvae, and the larvae are under the bark. The adults, when you're spraying adults on the foliage. Uh, you can knock them back, but it's just not enough to make a big difference. And the recommendations are don't treat the trees until EAB has been found within about 15 miles of where you're at. Otherwise, uh, it could be a big waste of time and money. Now, the, the, there is a counter argument to this, of course, and the counter argument is uh, what if EAB is here and we don't know it? And Sure, that's, uh, that's a fair enough question. Uh, so I, I can't answer that question. But this is the current recommendation. Uh, there's a joint uh, statement from Extension, North Dakota Department of Ag, and North Dakota Forest Service that states this because that's what has been found further east where they've been dealing with EAB on a regular basis. Now, certainly people can do that if they want, but we're not recommending it. Okay, uh, ash replacement species. What can we use to replant? And the first thing I want to say is no one species should replace ash. Diversify. That's how we got in this mess in the first place, is that ash was the species to replace American elm, and now there's a, an ash pest, so... Um, Diversify, diversify, diversify. And that being said, no one species really can replace ash. Green ash is so broadly adapted, uh, it's, really, it's really a great species. I know why it was overplanted, because it can handle droughts, but it can handle flooding. It can handle salt, uh, salty soils. It can do well on really nice soils, too. So... Um, Finding a species that can do that is next to impossible. And green ash was a great species. Now, that being said, we've also developed this North Dakota Tree Selector Program, uh, which I'll go through very briefly. Uh, it could use some work, but it's a good start. 
Okay, North Dakota Tree Selector. If you click on the website, go to the website, there's a list of 102 different species of trees and shrubs that will grow throughout most of North Dakota. Okay, but if you want to narrow it down to a tree that can replace green ash, let's look at these general characteristics on the upper left. Let's choose a tree and shrub. Let's choose tree. And for leaf retention, we'll do deciduous trees. Okay, deciduous trees, that actually narrows it down to about 50 species. Okay. And then if we go down to growth rate and we choose uh, mature height that are tall trees, trees greater than 45 feet at maturity, okay, we've narrowed it down to about 20 species. This is great. Um, there's actually quite a few options for replacing green ash. Uh, Want to narrow it down even more? Okay, let's go down to ornamental characteristics. And our ornamental characteristics uh, I've chosen here is fall, is not fall colors, flowers. Uh, something that has a nice big showy flower in the spring. And that really narrowed it down to one species, and that's American linden. Uh, in terms of, of ornamental characteristics, you could choose fall color, but I'll tell you right now, at least for trees, most everything's yellow. Uh, we just really don't have a lot of options. And that being said, uh, we've got this American linden. There's a, a very uh, quick and brief um, description of it. Uh, along with pictures, those are the characteristics uh, that it has, whether they're general characteristics as growth, ornamental, and as well as tolerances. Um, I take the, the flooding tolerance I don't want to say with a grain of salt, but there's uh, a lot of the information about flooding is really more, um, it, it's not tests so much as it's observations. And that being said, okay, we've, we've narrowed it down to a few choices. Hey, let's print a PDF of this. Okay, PDF, you can print this out. You have a nice little handout to give to your client. So, uh, any questions about that for right now? Or not. Okay. Say, hey, Joe, what's the website for that North Dakota tree selector? That is, <laughs> I got, Steve, I have to back up through all this because I don't have it off the top oh, of my okay. head. Okay. There you go. Is, do you see it there? Can you hang on just a second? I want to scribble that down because I just did a search for it and I couldn't find it. You know, um, we've been having a hard time with that. I have been trying to fix that issue because the search engines aren't finding it, they're not recognizing it, and I don't know why. Uh, I don't know if it's that there's that little dash in the, in the URL and the web address uh, or, or what. Um, but, yeah, the search engines are having a hard time finding it. Got it. Okay. All right. That being said, we're going to wrap it up here. There's a, a few more things um, I, I want to cover very quickly. Uh, there is a publication on EAB lookalikes, and this was put together by Jerry Fowski of the uh, Entomology Department here at NDSU. That's uh, publication E1604, and uh, I love this publication. It's nice and colorful and pretty. Uh, but it gives the most common uh, insects that will, people will confuse with the AB, uh, including I've, I've had people bring number four to me. That's a poplar borer. Uh, click beetles are common. Uh, number 18 there, the cicada, I can't imagine people confusing that, but they sometimes do. EAB Awareness Week will be in May of this year, May 18th to 24th, and we have a variety of activities planned. Uh, Todd, I think I'm going to have a, an EAB suit for you to wear, and you can use in your uh, programming. Will there be cake? Uh, as much cake as you can eat. I'll make sure you have cake. Thank you. You bet. Uh, if you want information on Emerald Ash Borer, this is the website. That's the, uh, the federally funded or federally maintained website. Um, I'm not sure how up-to-date it's kept anymore, uh, but 
it's it's updated every now and again, and there's actually quite a bit of information here that I think you'd find useful. And uh, my question that I would ask of the crowd here, uh, all seven of us, <laughs> is uh, what are your educational resource needs? Uh, what types of materials do we need to develop to meet your needs? You know, Joe, I wouldn't mind having more or less a dumbed down version of what you just showed us, something that would be, I could present at a horticulture society meeting or something that wouldn't take more than 20 or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in that, that I don't really mean to sound like it needs to be dumbed down, but uh, no. just the facts, you know, like our friend Colombo used to say, or, or no, right. Joe Friday. Joe Friday said that. Just the facts, please. You know, people are often asking what do they look like? You know, where are they at? What can I use to kill them? Those types of things. So, you know, just sure. a, a brief, not even too brief, but a little bit briefer presentation of what you just got because the stuff there is really excellent material. It's just that most people don't really want to know that much. Right, right. And this, this was certainly directed towards the professionals, towards you all, rather than towards the general public. Now, that being said, Steve, uh, in terms of the topics that are covered in such a presentation, are there additional topics you would add? Are there topics you would cut out of this? You know, um, a concern that I ran into, and, and this is kind of related to EAB and, and the use of a medical operant, but a concern that I ran into at a horticulture society meeting here just recently, and maybe Esther or Kasha could chime in on this too, and that is the way we are using a medical operant, uh, to control a lots of other kinds of insects besides EAB, particularly scale insects and aphids and things in trees other than ash. Uh, for example, uh, trees that blossom quite a bit, uh, flowering crabs, for example. What impact is that having on honeybees and other pollinating insects if that chemical translocates through the blossoms? Is that a concern at all? And I know that's not EAB related, but it, it is in a sense that we're using the same product for a lot of our trees in our in our yards besides just on ash. Is that Steve, a concern? Steve, this is Esther. I just saw uh, another webinar on uh, the effects of imidacloprid on pollinators, and you're right. Um, they say that that actually some of the neonicotinoids are part of the problem as to colony collapse disorder. So you're absolutely right about that. I guess I wouldn't use imidacloprid, uh, particularly on flowering crab apples. And, and others that have uh, that are pollinated by bees. Say, Esther, where where was that webinar located, or is that something that uh, we could also watch? Uh, sure. Actually, I guess I, it, it's really not a webinar. It was a, a TED talk by um, oh, what is her name? Um, Marla Spivak from the University of Minnesota. She's the one that got the um, the MacArthur Grant uh, for working on honeybees and, uh, and and colony collapse disorder. So yes, I can I can certainly pass that around. Now it is kind of a dumbed down version since it was a TED talk, but I'm sure I could find something that's a little bit more informative than the TED talk too for you. Okay. Can I just in. copy that, Esther, or maybe just send it to Absolutely. Edit? Sure, sure. <laughs> Back in uh, early 2011, there was a, a big to-do amongst all the uh, folks who are working on EAB further east. And there was a series of documents that came out uh, from different sides of the issue. Uh, there was a public letter signed by a bunch of people. And, uh, and and it was this very issue of of the effects of imidacloprid on pollinators. Um, the argument with ash is that ash is wind pollinated, and therefore uh, the neonicotinoids, uh, well, imidacloprid, has no effect on pollinators when it's used in ash. And I, I don't know whatever became of that because it really much it really pretty much died down at the beginning of 2011. Uh, and I can send you the, the list of who published what and when, um, but there was a publication, just more of a list of, of a list of publications, references, uh, developed by a, a fellow out of Cornell that he listed uh, bees and when they 
would gather, was it pollen or nectar? It was something from ash that uh, there was the potential there uh, for them to be, maybe they, maybe they didn't actually pollinate the tree, but they could have gathered pollen. I, I'm really not sure. I wasn't following it too closely, but there's a whole series of, of references there, and it went back and forth for a little while, but I haven't heard anything since. But, well, oh, go ahead. Joe, I guess there's a possibility that the bees could be collecting propolis. That's kind of the waxy substance that you find uh, uh, on the buds. Um, so maybe there is the possibility that that could be uh, spreading the neonicotinoids, I mean, even from ash. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the propolis is what the bees gather uh, to use as kind of a, oh, um, an, an antiseptic type of thing in their, in their hives for, for, hyge- for hygiene purposes to prevent fungal and bacterial growth. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I am certainly not <laughs> uh, an entomologist. This is news to me. So, um, I, now, I think I, you were... I was going to say, I think they they weren't saying that they were gathering um, that material. I think they did say, maybe it was nectar. Okay. But yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to look it up again. So, uh, Steve, it's, it's certainly a concern that uh, one, kind of on a related note, uh, how much imidacloprid is being used all over the place and... Uh, uh, is resistance going to develop? And that's what nobody knows, um, but it is a, a question and a concern that people have these days. Yeah. You know, the other thing that I'm concerned about is that the nurseries, and I'm not going to point any fingers, but a, a lot of them, or maybe it's just their employees, look at imidacloprid as some sort of a magic wand and controlling all kinds of leaf-eating insects. And so they're recommending it way beyond uh, just for uh, EAB control. And uh, I'm not sure that I, this has actually happened, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see them recommending it on fruit trees, and it can't be healthy to have that product getting into the edible fruit, like uh, apples, for example. And so maybe that's an educational uh, opportunity for us to, to maybe visit with them about that or something. But I know that they use it, they recommend it in way, way beyond its use in ash trees. And... Uh, uh, those types of problems I'm concerned about. Yeah. One one of the questions I would have first, though, is uh, where does the chemical go to within the tree? Uh, that's one thing. When I was in uh, Michigan visiting, they, they, they were doing a study with radio-labeled imidacloprid and seeing where it traveled within the tree. And uh, it doesn't go everywhere. There are certain places it can go based on its chemistry based on the size of the molecule and other places where it can't go. And uh, I would really be curious if it can uh, reach, um, what you call it, if it can reach the uh, flowers. So it it might. I don't know. I just, I really want to learn more myself on this topic. Well, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I'm sure somebody, if they haven't done research on it, maybe would be interested in doing research on it, but uh, to be able to determine just how far that it actually moves through the tree system would be really important to know because it might alleviate some concern. On the other hand, it might cause some concern, too. Right, right. I, yeah, personally, I just need to, to know more information. So. Okay. Uh, what other educational resources do you all need? What would be helpful to you? Deafening silence. Joe, I don't know if you can see this or not, but I have a little tiny emerald ash borer in a vial. Yep. I don't know if all the agents have those or not, but that would be kind of nice. Um, if nothing else, just to take it out and send it to you and say, hey, I found this weird bug. But, um, you know, it's kind of a, kind of a visual that, um, you know, it gives you the actual size and um, the coloring and what it looks like. And mm-hmm. so I don't know if this would be of of value. I don't know if every agent has them, but, but I have this song. I believe it was from you. Yeah, we sent out uh, EAB identification kits oh, a few years ago, and I think, uh, if not every office, most of the offices got them. And I think it was two years ago, I offered them again, 
and got a few takers on that. And that's one of the items within there. And uh, so I think a lot of folks do have that. Uh, I'm not sure how many. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, well, if there if there are other things that uh, you need, please let us know, and we can develop that kind of material and, and or items. There are a lot of promotional and outreach items available. Now, Pretty Joe? Funny. Yes. Now, now you had talked about the Master Gardener uh, EAB course, our first detector course, being done in Fargo. And, you know, maybe we could do um, a webinar similar to what you did here that could be used for continuing education for Master Gardeners that are further out in the state that mm -hmm. won't be able to come to training here. Sure, be happy to do that. Um, I'm I'm very happy to utilize the technology uh, since we have it. You know, and if it saves me from traveling, I mean, especially on a day like today as I'm sitting here and watching the snowfall, um, I think that's wonderful. So, absolutely. Okay, well, uh, if there are other things that you think we can develop, let us know. I'd be happy to do that. And uh, if you have other questions, uh, let us know for that, too. That was quite excellent. Nice job, Joe. Yes, thank you, Joe. Thanks. I, like I said, I was trying to hit the high points. There is so much information available on EAB. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, that being said, I really tried to hit the latest and greatest, some of the, the newer information that we have out there. And... Uh, I, I could give that whole webinar on biological control, uh, but I'll just send you send you to that because she did an excellent job. So uh, if you need anything else, let me know. Otherwise, have a great day and stay warm. You too. Thanks, Joe. You too. <laughs> you bet. Take care.